what I'd like to talk to you about today is, um, if I can find my, oh, here it is, uh, the uh, compartmentalization of the eukaryotic cell. In particular, uh, the organization of subcellular structures. Now, I think this is a really important area because um, we really don't appreciate uh, how important this type of subcompartmentalization has been to the evolution of life on Earth. Um, prokaryotes, in particular bacteria and archaea, although people have talked about them having some type of internal membrane system, it's really nothing compared to what you see uh, in the eukaryotic uh, uh, branch of life. Um, prokaryotes uh, really, through their simplicity, um, explored the world of metabolism in the world, whereas eukaryotes take that metabolism and because of the ability to create subcellular compartments, um, explore structural diversity throughout the planet. The last common eukaryotic ancestor had all of the subcellular compartments that we know characterize cells today. Um, Here's a mouse fibroblast full of subcellular compartments, the nuclear envelope, the endoplasmic reticulum, mitochondria, ER, and the simple toxoplasma gondii has all of the same organelles. This is really remarkable. I mean, basically all life, all eukaryotic life on Earth has the same subset of organelles, and these are, these are the, those organelles. Um, these organelles are playing important roles in many of the cellular um, systems, uh, the ER and Golgi, you all well know, are, is involved in secretion, endosome lysosome developed for uptake, degradation of materials, mitochondria, which is the um, bacteria uh, sort of precursor for the eukaryotic cell, is involved in energy production. And I should emphasize that for any of you guys interested in mitochondria, um, I think one way to think about them is uh, really they are um, an ancestral element of this uh, eukaryotic system that's absolutely critical uh, in terms of you know, driving um, the replicative cycle, energy production, et cetera. And I'd love to talk to students afterwards more about uh, mitochondria and how they really link to pretty much all processes within cells. Of course, we've got the nucleus where DNA replication storage is occurring, and then these two organelles, peroxisomes and lipid droplets, that a lot of people don't think much about. In fact, for most of my career, I, I ignored these two organelles, but now have become very interested in them. And the last part of my talk will be focused on peroxisomes and lipid droplets. Peroxisomes involved in detoxification of lipids, and lipid droplets involved in fat storage. Now, these subcompartments are really the basis uh, when, uh, when things go wrong in any of these subcompartments of the cell, you get medical conditions, you get diseases. And this is just a short list of a me a medical conditions that can be directly linked to particular subcellular compartments. So it's really important for us to understand um, how these organelles are uh, behaving uh, and how they uh, work uh, in this system. So what I want to talk to you today about is advances in microscopy that are expanding our understanding of these organelles. So let's start with the endoplasma reticulum. This is a grazing incidence uh, uh, structural illumination uh, microscopy time lapse sequence uh, where we're looking at a resident protein of the ER, cal reticulin, at 25 milliseconds per frame. And what you can see from these movies is the dynamism of the ER that we had not previously appreciated. In fact, um, if you zoom in on any one of these areas here, you can see that the tubular meshwork of that ER is undergoing an oscillatory motion that we hadn't been able to see previously or appreciate previously. But that oscillatory motion is dependent on ATP, GTP levels within the cell, and we think it's due to cytoplasmic fluctuations in the pressure uh, within, that, uh, within the cytoplasm as a result 
of the assembly and disassembly of cytoskeletal elements. Um, this activity, in addition to the ER's ability to move along microtubule tracks and to be pushed, uh, as I mentioned, by actin, uh, allows it to distribute throughout the entire cytoplasm. And it serves as the largest organelle within the cell. Its surface area is by far uh, much greater than any of the other organelles, and it operates as a single compartment. A uh, single protein uh, in one area of the ER can diffuse throughout the whole system. Now, <clears throat> if you look at the ER using conventional uh, confocal imaging techniques, you frequently, especially if you're looking at the periphery of the ER, um, oftentimes you see structures like this that have been described as ER sheets, flat sheets. But in fact, when we look at these structures at either high spati higher spatial or temporal resolution, we see that what in fact they represent are clusters of tubular reticular elements that have been drawn together. Um, we just haven't been able to see them because uh, we haven't collected our images quick enough or we, d we haven't had the uh, high enough resolution uh, to uh, see this. And this is particularly apparent when we move to a higher resolution technique called lattice light sheet paint microscopy developed by Eric Betzik and colleagues, um, where basically uh, it's it, uh, a bodipi uh, tetramethyl ester, which is a uh, photoactivatable photo lipid fluorophore, is being used uh, to single molecules to um, highlight individual lipid molecules uh, throughout the entire cell. And what you're seeing here is just Z-sectioning uh, through uh, a cell that has been fixed. Um, and each of the organelles that you see are identified because uh, we've fit all of the point spread functions of all of the lipid molecules that have bound and dissociated uh, during uh, the period uh, of collection. And so that's allowed us to uh, see these organelles. Here is mitochondria, this elaborate labyrinth of membranes here that looks like this meshwork is the endoplasmic reticulum. And if you zoom in on an area here in the periphery of the cell, you can see these ER matrices, uh, which really are just clustered three-way junctions of ER, that if we had been looking with conventional confocal approaches or even structural illumination microscopy, uh, because of um, the uh, fine aspects to the um, arrangement of these tubules would have appeared as a smooth sheet. So this is just to emphasize how important it is if you're going to really get at these structures within cells and understand how they are uh, arranged, you have to use um, the appropriate microscopy approach. Um, here's a, structure, a 3D structure illumination microscopy image uh, where each of the, color, the of the endoplasmic reticulum looking at an ER resonant protein, and uh, it's color-coded in 3D to give you uh, the perspective of the ER in 3D. But basically, uh, what these techniques are telling us is that the ER is an incredibly structurally complex compartment, um, and one that uh, we are only beginning to understand how its structure relates to specific functions of this organelle. Now, this organelle is involved in protein synthesis, calcium uh, 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 sequestration, as well as calcium release. Uh, it's also involved in the formation of contacts with other molecules. So one can, um, as I mentioned, uh, and I, it would be great if we had lights down for some of these movies that I'm going to show you, molecules move very fast within the endoplasmic reticulum. We first realized that when we did photo bleaching of a, an area of the ER. This is an ER that, that is expressing sex 61 beta, a subunit of the translocon. Uh, when we express it with a GFP, it's not associating with that translocon, so it's diffusing very fast throughout the ER. And if we photo bleach an area you can, of the ER, you can see very quick recovery of fluorescence into this region here indicative of free diffusion of these molecules. 
Well, recently, two postdocs in my lab, Chris uh, Obera and Johnny Nixon Abel, have taken this to another level to do single particle tracking of individual ER resident proteins in the ER to try to understand their motions and characterize how these molecules are moving on the surface of this elaborate membrane. So what you're looking at here is an M emerald um, ER marker, which is labeling this, the, the ER itself, because we, we need to know where the ER is if we're going to track individual particles. And the sex 63, which is the ER membrane protein that we're tracking, is tagged with an halo, a halo uh, 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 tag that we can then highlight with a photoactivatable dye. This was critical for us to get an, a bright enough signal to be able to see these individual molecules and track them. This is just showing the individual uh, molecules, but we can track these molecules as shown here. Uh, these trajectories represent individual molecules. In this case, we're looking at a cal reticulin with a KDEL sequence. This is real time, um, so you, you can see the actual motion of these molecules on the surface of the ER. They seem to be uh, diffusing freely throughout this system. Now, not all molecules within the ER diffuse freely. Um, we discovered that uh, when we looked at a protein called VAT-B, which is involved in uh, contacts between ER and other organelles. So VAT-B can reach off the surface of the ER and bind to other proteins localized on other organelles to bring these organelles in close opposition. So here we have um, that B that we're tracking. White is the ER, uh, where we, so we have an ER probe, so we can track the ER. And in red represents mitochondria. And what you can see with all of these trajectories uh, that we're plotting out, uh, tracking that B, is that that B is spending more time on the surface of the ER that is making contact with ER. Um, and this is shown in higher resolution up here. The ER is shown in green. The red is the mitochondria. And you can see that the VAT-B that's in the region of ER that's in close opposition with the mitochondria has dramatically changed its diffusional characteristics. It's not immobile, but it's showing very interesting uh, mobility that we think represents a type of binding and dissociation of this molecule as it moves in these, this vicinity of close opposition of these two, two organelles. Now, that B plays the ability of that B to connect these two organelles, to bind these two organelles together, is thought to be important to allow the ER to release calcium into the mitochondria and also to allow lipid transfer between ER and mitochondria. So it's, it's playing a really important role in cells. So this got us excited and um, about using various imaging strategies to get better insight into interorganelle contacts. And so one approach that we've been taking is multispectral imaging. Um, and basically, um, this approach uses um, the ability to unmix um, overlapping uh, spectra of different floor fours to be able to visualize a set of up to six or more floor fours simultaneously. That is not possible unless you engage in a type of uh, unmixing algorithm, unless you input out unmixing algorithms, because these floor fours will overlap um, otherwise. But basically, what you can see in this time lapse movie are peroxisomes colored in blue, mitochondria in green, ER yellow, Golgi lysosome lipid droplets. Now, this is a, la uh, a um, merged lattice light sheet movie where we're seeing all of these organelles throughout the entire cytoplasm of this cell. Enormous information is contained in this movie. From this movie, we were able to calculate the surface area of the ER, 
uh, related to the surface area of lysosomes and mitochondria. Um, but we could also see, as shown down in this set of panels, when we segmented individual organelles, we could see that many of them are tightly opposed to each other. They're making contact with each other. Um, and uh, this is just a uh, frequency map of that contact, uh, where we're looking at association of any two organelles uh, with each other. Um, and this is just the number of contacts uh, that we're ob observing. Now, this was exciting to us because what we found was that in any particular cell, uh, this pattern of contacts seemed to be conserved over time for that cell. Um, even though the, all of these organelles are highly dynamic, they seem to um, maintain a sort of subset of interactions over long periods of time. And if we perturbed the conditions of that cell, if we starved the cell or we depolymerized microtubules, we could dramatically change uh, the, uh, freq the, the type of inner organelle contacts that we were observing. Now, this data was exciting, but it immediately raised issues. Uh, one is, we're diffraction limited. I mentioned at the beginning of the talk how important it is to be at the right spatial resolution if you're going to address a particular question. Our pixel levels here are at best about 120 nanometers. And these contact sites are much more, uh, are much closer than 120 nanometers. So that led us to move to another type of imaging regime to get deeper insight into these 3D uh, organelle, contact, into these organelle contacts. And that's using electron microscopy, where you can get even significantly improved resolution. The type of electron microscopy that we're using is scanning electron microscopy. And the overall uh, sort of flow uh, is really done in collaboration with Harold Hess, who's made this process seamless and allowed uh, sequential uh, scanning EM images to be acquired over weeks, if not months, uh, through some amazing engineering uh, that he's done to the system. Basically, we take cells uh, that are on sapphire cover slips, so they're super clean. We then high pressure freeze them, free substitute, resin embed, and then the cells sitting in this uh, block right here. And basically, this is when the magic starts because you can scan, you can do scanning electron microscopy across this surface, and then you use a focused ion beam to shave off four nanometers slices at a time, and then you do another scanning electron microscopy. You do this thousands and thousands of time to gather a whole data set through the cell. And that's what we've done here. This is a HeLa cell where we've essentially scanned through four nanometers at a time uh, through this whole system. So we have four nanometer voxels uh, through an entire HeLa cell. Pretty cool. It took two weeks uh, to collect this data. Um, but then the challenge is, what do you do with this data? <laughs> it's a lot of information in here. And uh, basically, you try to segment it. And that's what Aubrey Beigel in my lab has been doing. Um, this is just a small little subset of that data where she's uh, essentially segmented out mitochond uh, microtubules, endosomes, ER, and mitochondria. And what you can see from the segmented images through a big chunk of the cell is just how crowded things are and how closely connected these organelles are. So this is the ER, and you can see how intimately it's associated with mitochondria. Here's your microtubule. Down here in purple are the endosomes. Now, Aubrey has been. Um, because this has been so exciting at Genelia, we've set up a project team with Aubrey as the lead to begin segmenting everything in that cell that we can identify. And so basically, um, here are uh, a whole list of different organelles. 
uh, that we've been able to segment out in, in particular subparts of this uh, full volume set. Um, the goal is to be able to, set, uh, what this data set is providing is ground truth for machines who can do this automatically. So our goal is to connect with um, the computational crowd at Genelia, we're doing that right now, to be able to um, essentially seamlessly go scan through these images of these cells uh, and be able to automatically uh, segment different organelles. But in order to do that, we have to train these computers and we train them through ground truth that a bunch of uh, postdocs and students uh, are a sort of acquiring by hand. Because basically, you got to go through each of these four nanometer sections and say, OK, there's ER, here's mitochondria. And then the next section, you do the same and the same and the same. It takes really a long time. Just this data set here took uh, several months to, to uh, segment out. So that you can, in order for us to move this technology forward, we have to mesh with com the, the computational um, crowd uh, to be able to do this automatically. And so this is a really exciting effort now at Genelia because uh, our hope is to do this not only with HeLa cells, but with pretty much any cell that anybody wants to look at. OK, so let's get back to interorganelle contacts. What do they do, and how can we learn more about them? So I mentioned they're involved in lipid exchange, calcium transfer. They're also uh, playing an important role for, we think, for selective areas of ROS release, and also organelle division. This uh, organelle division was perhaps one of the, the most sort of uh, exciting uh, uh, observations uh, made by Gia Voltz many years ago, uh, where uh, she showed that uh, the ER seems to wrap around mitochondria uh, right before they divide. So look at this little mitochondria here. You can see there's the ER in purple. And it, soon it, it wraps around it, sets up a fission a machinery, and the system divides. So this was really, I think, um, a very important insight on the part of Giavoltz and others in the field. Uh, in terms of recognizing that these organelle contact sites can do more than just lipid transfer. They can actually drive the remodeling of these organelles themselves. We were wondering whether interorganelle contacts could help distribute organelles throughout cells. Why? Because we know that some organelles, like lysosomes, shown in green here, can move very efficiently along microtubule tracks. Um, purple is endoplasmic reticulum. The green is endosomes. And you can see that the endosomes are almost always associated with ER. And they're moving very quickly all over the surface of that ER. And they are moving by virtue of their ability to recruit uh, microtubule motors uh, and move on, that, on these microtubule tracks. But as they do it, they seem to be remodeling the ER in different ways. And so we were interested in sort of looking at this more carefully, um, uh, especially in the context of other people's observations, in particular Amy Gladfeller's observation in, in uh, fungi, that organelles can hitchhike with each other to move uh, uh, in different places in the cell. So, the story that I want to tell you about related to this um, really came from a very talented uh, postdoc in my lab, Ya Cheng Lao, where she observed that RNA granules, uh, these are stress granules, so they're membraneless, um, shown in red here, actually hitchhike on lysosomes to move around in the cell. So green is microtubules. Lysosomes are your white, and the red is the stress granules. And that was pretty cool. Um, <clears throat> in fact, if you look in a rat axon, what you see is that there is co-trafficking of the RNA in the stress granule with the lysosome. That's how the RNA stress granule is able to move. 
in this axon. Um, so this is like, wow. Uh, you know, this could be the way that RNA stress granules are actually moved around in the cell by hitchhiking on these motile lysosomes. If that's the case, what is responsible for linking these two organelles? And linking is indeed going on. Here is correlative electron microscopy, where we're looking at a stress granule marker, G3BP1, BP labels the RNA granule. Lysosome is in white here, uh, labeled by LAMP1. If we zoom in and look at the electron micrograph of this, you can see the RNA stress granule. It's got no membrane associated with it. It's just this blobby stuff. And the lysosome right next to it. So what is causing these two organelles to come together? What's tethering them? That was the question that we were interested in. Because this is not an ordinary tether. Uh, on the one hand, you have a membrane-bound organelle, a lysosome. And on the other, you have a membranous organelle. There's no membranes. How do these guys come together? Well, we think it's related to this really interesting protein called annexin A11. Um, I'm going to show you data that supports the idea that it is an adapter between lysosomes and RNA granules. This work was done in collaboration with Michael Ward at NIH, um, who has been interested in a long time in annexin A11 because of its ability uh, to associate with RNA granules. And indeed, here's an image of this. Uh, here's an XNA11. Here's an RNA granule marker. Here's the mRNA, so that you know that there's RNA associated with this. Before heat shock, none of these proteins, uh, or RNA, are in any way localized to particular puncta within cells. But after heat shock, they all go onto the same structure. Uh, an XN11, the stress granule marker, and the mRNA. This is called phase con condensation of mRNA in conjunction with proteins uh, in response to a heat shock. We could also see that if we look at this movie up here, that an XN11 is moving with lysosomes on axons. So this is, a, uh, this is an axon, and if you just look at the uh, this is a chymograph showing uh, co-localization of an XNA11 and lysosomes. Um, as the lysosome moves down that axon, it carries with it the RNA stress granule that has an XNA11 associated with it. So what is an XNA11? Well, uh, Lucy Forst uh, at NIH has uh, come up with this tentative structure uh, for an XNA11. And it turns out to be quite an interesting molecule in two respects. First, it has an X in repeat domains on this surface that can bind calcium and can interact with membrane. On the end terminus of this protein is a low complexity domain, or an intrinsically disordered domain, um, which is characteristic of these proteins that go into these phase droplets that you're all familiar with, I am sure. So we were interested in sort of looking to see whether these two characteristics of an X and I-11 might, might play a role in linking lysosome and RNA stress granules. So we first looked at an X and I-11's ability to interact with membranes. And what we found is that it can interact with negatively charged lysosome-associated phospholipids in vitro. In particular, uh, it shows affinity for PI35P, PI3P, 3I5P, um, but only in the presence of calcium. And this is sort of interesting because this suggests that without calcium, um, an XNA11 is not going to bind to membranes. And that immediately implies some kind of regulation for how, for instance, the lysosome might be able to drop off an RNA stress granule somewhere. Um, we also found that, and this is in collaboration with Peter St. George Hyslop 
at Cambridge, <coughs> that an X, recombinant X and 11 undergoes liquid to liquid phase separation in vitro. This is the protein uh, in, at four degrees. It's clear solution. You shift to a higher temperature, it becomes cloudy because it's forming these liquid droplets. And this is just showing they, these droplets form simply by crowd, with crowding agents, 10% dextran. You'll drive this protein into these liquid condensates. So basically, um, these characteristics of an XNI11 led us to speculate that maybe the way it's working is the NX and repeat domains binding to lysosomes when lysosomes are pumping out calcium, and its low complexity domain integrating with the RNA stress grammar. Um, so this would, this would be the model for how NX and 11 could serve as a tether um, or an adapter to bring these two organelles together. Well, what's really interesting about NX and 11 and is part of the reason why people like Michael Ward have been really interested in it for years, is that it is what it, mutants of uh, NXNA11 are one of the major causes of amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, or ALS. So we wanted to see whether these NXNA11 mutants could interfere with the association um, of RNA granules and lysosomes within cells. Um, reasoning that that might be the basis for what's going on with this disease. You don't get RNA granules taken down an axon, you're not going to get protein translation uh, at the proper place in these neurons. So that was the thinking for ch testing what was going on with this mutant. And sure enough, uh, we looked, here are three AL, uh, ALS mutants of an XNA11, and you can see that these two have a dramatic effect on the ability of um, uh, lysosomes and NX and A11 to associate with each other. Um, we also found that these ALS-associated NX and mutants um, drive aggregate-like behavior of NX and A11, which could potentially be uh, involved in why these mutants don't interact very well. Uh, with lysosomes uh, or stress granules. So here's a uh, individual uh, RNA, or here's an ind individual liquid condensate of an XN11 uh, that's formed within a cell. If we photobleach it, it rapidly recovers because these molecules are diffusing, the partitioning in and out of these condensates. We do not see that when we form agri uh, uh, condensates of any of the ALS mutants of NXNA11. And this is just showing that um, in axons, here's an axon, if we track lysosomes and RNA stress granules labeled with G3BB1, the RNA stress granules just don't go anywhere uh, in contrast to the lysosome. This is wild type. You can see lysosomes are being carried, ferried by um, the uh, stress granule marker. So in sum, we think we've identified a very interesting intraorganelle uh, tethering molecule, an XNA11, that brings together these two very different organelles, lysosomes and RNA granules, for the purpose of delivering the RNA granule down the axon, because lysosomes uh, robustly associate with microtubules and can move all over the cell. RNA granules, um, at least in our hands, don't have that ability. But they can hijack or hitchhike a ride on lysosomes. Now, what's interesting about this model, and it's something that we're looking at right now, is this calcium dependence of an XNA11 binding to lysosomes. We think that this could potentially serve as a function for allowing the cell to control when to release the RNA granule from the lysosome at a particular place along the neuron so that that RNA uh, granule can start releasing its mRNA, uh, which can then be used for translation purposes. OK. Well, what about other interorganelle tethering proteins and their structure? 
At the beginning of the talk, I mentioned that I was going to talk about two organelles, lipid droplets and peroxisomes, that probably many of you could care less about. But in fact, they're quite interesting. Um, so we're going to shift thinking to a whole different set of organelles uh, that intercommunicate with each other in a really important way uh, to allow cells to survive all kinds of stress um, related to uh, metabolism, lipid accumulation. So lipid droplets um, are structures that are really important because they store excess fatty acids and phospholipids. Um, they form off the surface of the ER uh, as a lensed out monolayer uh, and uh, are full of triacylglycerides and sterile esters uh, that ultimately are going to be food for the cell under starvation conditions or other stress types of conditions. So lipid droplets are super, super important. Now, in order for the lipid droplet, uh, the contents of this lipid droplet to actually be converted into lipid metabolites that will drive uh, for instance, mitochondrial oxidative phosphorylation, give you energy, um, these uh, triglycerides and sterile esters have to be broken down through beta oxidation. Short chain and medium chain fatty acids will undergo beta oxidation in the mitochondria. But very long chain fatty acids, the kind that you take in when you eat potato chips and you know, french fries, et cetera, they got to move through the peroxisome to undergo beta oxidation, to be broken down into um, uh, lipid metabolites that can then be either tur uh, be turned over and used as an energy source uh, for um, mitochond the mitochondria. So we were interested in how uh, fatty acids move from lipid droplets to peroxisomes. Could direct contacts between these two organelles play a role in that process. So uh, a postdoc in my lab, Chi Lung Chang, um, has been looking at this. And uh, it's interesting because he didn't, he didn't start out you know, with this goal in mind. It just sort of fell out. Um, when he was looking at this protein, M1 spastin. So M1 spastin localizes to lipid droplets as well as ER, and is a, 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 a um, hereditary spastic paraplegia protein, meaning that when many of its mutants lead to HSP disease, which is a neurodegenerative disorder. Um, so lots of people are interested in what this M1 spastin is doing uh, to give rise to hereditary spastic paraplegia. So we decided, OK, let's take a look at this. Maybe it's related to um, organelle communication in some way. So here uh, we've got, here's M1 spastin. You can see it's labeling these round structures, which are distributed on the surface of the ER and are lipid droplets. And it's on the surface of these lipid droplets, because the M1 has, is a hairpin that can allow the spastin to dip into the, the monolayer of the um, lipid droplet. So here's Chi Lan Chang. And his key observation that really started off this uh, whole project was when he overexpressed M1 spastin, he found that lipid droplets and peroxisomes came very close together. Um, at steady, in normal cells, they aren't necessarily closely opposed. There's some. Um, close apposition, uh, but it's not super apparent. But if you overexpress spastin, they just come together. Lipid droplets, peroxisomes just, just come close together under those conditions. And you can see this by electron, uh, correlative light electron microscopy. Here's your peroxisome uh, labeled with SKL, and here's the lipid droplet um, in this image right here and in this light level image. <coughs> And this is a uh, uh, focused ion beam scanning EM, uh, where here is the lipid droplet, and these are peroxisomes that are tightly associated with, with these um, lipid droplets uh, under M1 overexpression. 
Now, as I mentioned, M1 spastin is mutated in hereditary spastic paraplegia disease. And uh, what we found is uh, when we overexpressed mutant spastin, we didn't get that type of peroxisome lipid droplet overlap. So something about the mutation uh, uh, giving rise to these diseases in spastin was interfering with the ability of peroxisomes and lipid droplets to come close together. So let's look at the structure of M1 spastin in a little bit more detail. We don't have a crystal or atomic structure of, uh, of it, but we've got, um, we can see it in terms of all of its uh, various uh, uh, motifs. The hairpin, as I mentioned, at the end terminus of this protein is involved in membrane insertion. This is the, the, the way it associates with ER or uh, the monolayer of the lipid droplet. And then it's got a mid domain, a microtubule uh, binding domain, and a triple ATPase domain. <coughs> Chi Long <coughs> uh, scoured this uh, different parts of this protein to, to look to see if there was a specific sequence in M1 spastin that interacted uh, with peroxisomes. And it was this motif right in here uh, that, uh, was abs what, that was critical for this protein to um, uh, allow lipid droplets to come together and bind uh, peroxisomes. Interestingly, if we did IPs, immunoprecipitation, of, uh, of this motif, with peroxisomal, with, with cell lysates, we pulled down a peroxisomal fatty acid transporter, ABCD1. This was like amazing, um, exactly what you might anticipate for what we were seeing. Basically, this part of spastin seems to be interacting. Um, so spastin's on the lipid droplet. This part of spastin is, seems to be interacting with peroxisomal membrane by, through uh, binding to this peroxisomal fatty acid transport. Perfect situation for allowing fatty acids to move from the lipid droplet into the peroxisome for beta oxidation. Well, what about this MIT motif? Uh, MIT domains are widely known to uh, interact, uh, be sites for escort protein interaction. And hopefully everybody knows uh, something about escort proteins. They're involved in membrane shaping. So what kind, but there's a lot of different types of escorts, escort, um, uh, escort three varieties. Uh, here's a whole slew of different escort three proteins. Uh, and uh, pr uh, prior work has shown uh, that uh, two of these guys, IST1 and CHIMP1B, specifically interact with spastin, M1 spastin. Now, what's interesting about the way these, uh, uh, es this escort three, these two escort threes interact uh, with membranes is that unlike the conventional way that escort proteins shape membranes, which is to um, essentially um, move, create spirals inside of a tube, the IST1 and CHIMP1 do, Chip 1B um, uh, form a filament on the outside of the membrane, as shown here. So they're spiraling around sort of the way people have thought the dynamin can spiral around uh, uh, tubes um, uh, to narrow that membrane and potentially drive some kind of fission event or just remodeling of that membrane. So we look to see what happened if we express IST1, escort 3, and peroxisomes in our cells. And we find that, sure enough, IST1 associates with lip droplets when we overexpress M1 spastin. And that's shown here. Here are the peroxisomes in red. Here is the um, lipid droplets uh, in green. And they're decorated with this IST1, uh, uh, escort 3, that we've labeled. Um, so this is supporting the idea that Spastin, M1 spastin on the lipid droplet is recruiting IST1 and CHIMP1B to that lipid droplet <coughs> and potentially playing a role in remodeling 
the outer membrane, that monolayer of that lipid droplet, to facilitate fatty acid transfer from the lipid droplet to the peroxisome. And that's, that model is illustrated here. So what I've shown you up to now is that this, this um, M1 spastin uh, is associating with lipid droplet through this hairpin motif. Uh, its PIXI domain, peroxisomal interacting domain, reaches out to interact with the ABC transporters on the peroxisome. That brings these two organelles together and now we speculate that the escort proteins, IST1 and CHIMP1B, are remodeling the surface of that lipid droplet by you know, drawing out tiny little tubules or whatever that then allows for um, either the activity of um, enzymes that are going to break down uh, the triglycerides and other uh, 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 lipid species in the lipid droplet to allow for fatty acid a transfer between these two organelles. So that's the model. Can we test it in any way? And here are some experiments that are consistent with the model. Um, we find that uh, if we label lipid droplets, we fill them up with a fluorescent fatty acid, NBDC12. We can see that these it will accumulate in the lipid droplet if we knock down spastin. We get less transfer to peroxisomes, and we get buildup of the fatty acid in the lipid droplet uh, when we knock down spastin, consistent with spastin playing a role in transferring the fatty acids from the lipid droplets to the peroxisome. Likewise, if we knock down IST1 or CHIMP1B, we get the same result. Accumulation of the fatty acids in the lipid droplet and less transfer to peroxisomes. Now, interestingly, we also see accumulation of peroxidated fatty acids in lipid droplets uh, with spastin mutants. And this potentially connects to disease. Anytime you are stressed or eat a horrible high-fat diet, you're going to accumulate a lot of lipids, fatty acid lipids, that can get peroxidate, peroxidate include, and, and anytime you have inflammation, you peroxidate your fatty acids in your membranes. Those peroxidated fatty acids are ultimately delivered into the lipid droplet. And the only way you get rid of them is through the peroxisome, because the peroxisome has the enzymes that can break down these peroxidated um, fatty acids. And so um, we think that this suggests that these, these spastin mutants are linked uh, to this type of uh, this transfer um, uh, through linking the two organelles together and driving uh, membrane remodeling that allows for efficient fatty acid uh, movement from lipid droplet into the fatty acid. So with that, I want to end and say that um, we've identified um, two different proteins that are involved in two very different types of organelle-organelle contacts or interactions that are playing really important roles in the way the cell is doing its metabolism. And what's interesting is both of these proteins give rise to human disorders. Now, we don't know whether, in fact, uh, the only effect of an XNA11 mutants is in messing up RNA granule transport. It could be doing other things, and in fact, um, that's something we're looking at. Uh, and likewise, whether spastin is doing uh, other things than just uh, tethering lipid droplets to peroxisome. But our data is clearly showing that this is part of that disorder process, and it would have been very difficult to be able to figure this out if you did not use these imaging approaches to actually look at the relationship of these organelles with each other and treat these diseases as sort of holistic phenomenon um, of a very complex intraorganellar system. So with that, I want to acknowledge uh, people in my lab. Um, spastin, as I, the work on spastin was driven by Chi Long Chang, and these are um, the list of uh, sort of collaborators in that work. Um, Ya Cheng Lao uh, was the lead person in the Nexon A11 work, but it was a very close collaboration with Michael Ward, uh, who 
uh, really drew us to the NXNA 11 uh, through his amazing work, proteomics work, uh, together with his graduate student, Michael um, uh, Fernand Deflu. Uh, and uh, our imaging uh, team includes uh, Aubrey working in close col collaboration with Harold Hess's team. We do a lot of collaboration with Eric Betzik's lab, and I want to thank uh, Craig Blackstone for his contribution uh, for um, some of the, the ER mutants and other work that we've done uh, with the ER. So with that, thank you so much.